but also you can switch quickly uh, back and forth between different tasks uh, if you're looking at tasks that require different contexts uh, within the uh, particular task. Uh, another, uh, I think, advantage, uh, we've been looking at not the somatomotor cortex, which provides direct projections into the spinal cord and also receives direct uh, outputs of the spinal cord in terms of somatosensory feedback. So when uh, damage occurs here, it has an effect on the somatomotor cortex. We know it goes through reorganization and degeneration. Uh, but this um, visual motor area that we're reporting from, primarily the parietal cortex, but also in the three motor areas, uh, is a bit more remote from this direct uh, spinal pathway. And so it may be that it's more immune <coughs> to the effects of, of degeneration of lesion. And uh, also another uh, interesting point is that uh, when uh, you have a lesion to the spinal cord, you lose the major uh, feedback information for learning the position of the limb, uh, but you still can see the, um, uh, say if you go to reach for something, you can't be missed, you can see the error signal. And uh, for the areas we report from the uh, East Village Visual Motor areas, so that uh, sensory input is maintained for these areas and may be important for learning. Okay, so uh, just to outline to what uh, some other particulars of the cognitive prosthetics, that doesn't have to be uh, confined to a single brain area. So I'll show you data both from uh, parietal reach region and also premotor cortex. Uh, it, we can, um, so we imagine that the eventual prosthetic will be uh, large numbers of uh, electrodes implanted in a variety of areas within the somatic uh, uh, sensory motor pathway. Uh, and so really it's the nature of the signal that's being uh, extracted that defines the uh, cognitive nature of this prosthetic. And it can be used in combination with motor prosthetics. So you can also implant motor cortex and retrieve projectors as well. Okay, so the one area that we've been concentrating on is uh, this area of the parietal lobe called the uh, parietal reach region. And it's specialized in uh, coding and visual coordinates the goal of a movement uh, and the movement being the reach movement. So it says, uh, I want to reach to this thing I see, rather than how to uh, get there. Uh, typically what we do is we plant uh, arrays of uh, wires, uh, usually about 96 wires into uh, the bridal lobe of each monkey. And uh, this is uh, an example of a recording from one of those wires. Uh, of course, they all don't look this well. <laughs> Uh, uh, and so then we have the monkey do two tasks. So in the beginning of the day, we bring him in and he uh, develops a database, a recording from a group of neurons, and we build up a database based on the monkey making actual reaching. Uh, so what he does is he fixates a little light that appears on the screen and presses its uh, touch sensitive uh, screen, a little light operating an ATM, and he presses a uh, little green uh, point, another green point flashes somewhere in the periphery, and then he sits and he's in the dark because of these little uh, points of light, thinking about reaching to the location here. Then he gets a go signal for the light he's pressing goes out, and then he goes to the head and reaches the remembered location of the target on the screen gets there, uh, he then uh, gets a reward, uh, which is a drop of juice of water. Now this is a video of the monkey doing the task. And what you see here, uh, this is his hand, uh, this is his mouth here, he's drinking the juice, he's trying to get rewarded. Uh, you'll probably notice uh, that when he makes the reach, well here this would be toward the side of the hand, so it gets all the way over. Uh, but when he reaches across his body, he, uh, or even up, which he doesn't like to do too much, he likes to reach down more. Uh, you can see he'll be more accurate there. 
Uh, so what he's learned is that there's a little electronic window around the point to which he reaches, and so he learns the edge of that. And he just comes to uh, uh, within the edge of the <laughs> so we uh, build up this database, and then what we do is we use uh, what we call a Bayesian decode. Uh, so basically what that means is that we develop the statistics of these receptive fields of the different neurons. Uh, so, um, and these might be the different cells that we're reporting from and their uh, receptive fields for reaching the different locations in space. And then, uh, once we have that, those statistics, we can take one input of data, uh, one trial, and have activity from the different neurons, uh, say this could be neuron 1, 2, or 3, and these are the activities, and then we can predict based on that activity, and given the prior knowledge we have about the activity of the cells, what's the most likely the direction in which the monkey is planning to make a movement. Are you just going for direction mainly, or are you going also for uh, Well, we've done amplitude now, too. Uh, which is kind of interesting, because uh, uh, up until now, uh, all motor control experiments have looked at direction. And they've made comments like, amplitude tuning is made in the basal ganglia or other structures. Uh, but it turns out these are actual receptive and so it shows both the uh, uh, amplitude and direction. And we're finding the same thing in premolecular cortex. So next we go to what we call a brain control experiment. Uh, so now the monkey starts out the same as before. He gets his attached uh, cue to where he should plan a movement. Then he just thinks about making the movement there. And at that period, we then decode where we think he's thinking about making the movement. And then we indicate to him where that is. And if it's in the right spot, then he uh, gets his proper just reward. So this is now an example of what we doing the task. Uh, so in this case, it turns out he's getting every one of them right. Uh, so here you can see the breaking away and it's uh, getting these. Uh, and it turns out, so they pick it up immediately. We find a number of monkeys on this now. And since we're rewarding them just for thinking about it, they just uh, pick it up immediately. Uh, then when we try to get them to go back to collecting databases with the reaches, they don't want to do it. <laughs> uh, they're, uh, uh, because it's uh, much easier just to think about it uh, than to actually uh, uh, do the reaches. So, uh, so we kid around with, their, uh, with our theorist colleagues and our monkeys in the theorists. So this shows data then from one neuron uh, where it appears where the stimulus goes off. Uh, and these are trials where they actually made the reach in red. Uh, so this is the waiting period where the decode is planned. Uh, when he's making the reach, instead of just before the reach, there's further motor activation. Uh, whereas these are the brain control trials. In this case, he doesn't make movements, so there's no sort of additional reach activity. But you can see otherwise, the planning activity is the same. And this just shows a decoding from the parietal reach <coughs> Uh, for one session, uh, so this is during one day, there are six targets in this day, two chance levels are here. These are the number of trials during the brain control task. And uh, this just shows the performance here. Uh, that's the number of the performance of the trial. Why just start with Oh, well, yeah, because, uh, because it didn't go well in the beginning. That's just a couple. So this is cumulative. Yeah. So sometimes it'll start out here and go up. And this is uh, an example uh, taken from the dorsal premotor cortex, again, uh, decoding the goal location. This, in this case, it's for eight targets. Uh, so the chance of that here on the is half percent, and uh, here at 67 percent. Now, uh, what we found was there was a uh, learning effect. Uh, this is for two monkeys. Uh, 
And you can see at best for this animal, the recordings weren't uh, quite as good for a monkey see. But you see that uh, this is success rate, and these are over, over different days. And you can see as the uh, first, uh, the two monkeys start out around chance, and then they improve their performance uh, as days go by. So you can see in particular with this one monkey where we've got very good recordings uh, going out to 68 days, I believe. Uh, you can see you continue to improve. Yeah, um, uh, when you make an error, is the error typically like the next, the next right. part of the open? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's rare that uh, he gets the wrong, uh, totally wrong location. Although sometimes it's like he drifts off. And uh, then, uh, and also, uh, so we noticed, well, uh, actually I'll show you the next uh, uh, portion. It depends a lot on the mood and motivation of the animal. So uh, in the beginning, we were, uh, you know, toward the end of the day, the performance would go down. So we were the physiologist we would up the reward. And then some of the neurons just respond better, and the readout would be better. So actually, that's introduced to the next part, uh, which is <clears throat> we found that uh, we could cue the monkey ahead of time what to expect. So, uh, so since we saw this improve, improving in performance with the larger magnitude reward, but what we would do is tell him a trial by trial basis uh, by the queue uh, that appears. And some days a large queue would mean a non-preferred reward, other days a large queue is a preferred reward. And uh, so in about 10 trials he learned what the queue meant at each, on each day. And then if, you know, for instance in this case, he used a trial and where the red is where it keeps getting water for single cells in four directions. And the, um, the uh, black or the grasses when he's uh, getting orange juice. So this monkey uh, likes orange juice. Uh, we've even found monkeys that differentiate between apple and orange juice. Uh, so you can see that we can, uh, this is before he, uh, this is prank control, right? So he's not committing any behavior. Well, we can actually uh, decode, uh, this is during the uh, waiting period, uh, which juice is preferred. Also in the juice in the performance. So uh, this slide here just shows that, uh, in fact, this is true when the monkey has a when planning, uh, I mean, reach trials, when he knows he's going to get some courage in the work, uh, the reaction time is uh, quicker than the monkey and not here we're decoding two decodes simultaneously. Uh, and one decode is decoding for the preferred when he's expecting his preferred reward. Uh, the other is decoding when he's uh, expecting his non preferred You can see uh, the difference in performance that corresponds to the range of the And I should mention that this occurs for preference. Uh, the type of group, but also for the magnitude of the reward here, expecting larger or smaller reward, and also even for the probability. So sometimes uh, we indicate whether 80% uh, of the time you get a reward or only 40% of the time. Uh, and here this just shows that we can simultaneously read out and go, uh, his, the direction he plans to move and whether he's expecting a large or a small reward. So we can read out both uh, cognitive or values uh, simultaneously from the population of activity. So this indicates that uh, one could actually read out uh, several uh, cognitive signals uh, from a group of cells online at the same time. Now, uh, what's interesting is we can actually connect this to a uh, uh, field that's been developed called uh, Neuroeconomics. So uh, this is much like making decisions in the marketplace, where you have what's called expected value, which is proportional to the value of the reward and the probability of the reward that you expect. And so in the brain, uh, we saw that we could just put the probability of the reward, the value, whether it's the magnitude of the reward or the food preference, or even, I didn't show this, but even the difficulty of the task, when the monkey is doing an easier task, uh, the activity is higher. 
than when he's uh, doing a more difficult thing. And so from a prosthetics point of view, this means that we can look at the decision making of the subject. Uh, we can also uh, read out a patient's preferences continuously online. And uh, we can also determine online and continuously their mood and motivation. So, uh, so uh, just to conclude that, uh, the, uh, these experiments were done in particular with uh, Sam Muslam, uh, Brian Cornel, uh, and Bradley Greger, and Todd Scherberger, the uh, recording data I'm showing you. <coughs> we also uh, worked closely with the uh, Bergen Lab, uh, Zoran Advantage, who is in the audience here today, has just uh, uh, got a, a job at UC Irvine in engineering, so those of you at uh, Irvine might want to go to the Kali on the break. And um, also, uh, we worked with the colleagues at JPL. And just to conclude then, the cognitive variables of goal and expected value can be uh, decoded uh, with the brain control path. Uh, these goal signals can be then decoded by a smart machine, which could then uh, read out what you intend to do to operate various vehicles with the robot. And the expected value signal can be used to continuously monitor the uh, moods and motivations of the subject. So, you could always ask them, are you feeling good? And they would say that the trajectory planner moves are good or bad on the computer screen. But of course, while you're watching me here, you can tell whether I'm bored or engaged or uh, uh, it's early in the morning or uh, in the afternoon. So we're constantly reading uh, from a person's body language what their, um, uh, uh, their mood and motivation. So this could be an additional nice feature for a patient who's completely paralyzed who can actually in sense continu continuously use their body language. Uh, and you can imagine uh, taking this a step further, which would be to go to speech here. So right now, a paralyzed person uh, has a board with letters on it, and they try to move a cursor, or that's the idea at least, through different letters to spell things out. And where this has been tried, it's uh, usually one or two or three letters per minute. It's very slow. But if you could decode directly from speech areas, you could be reading out the speech on the subject. And you could also imagine some wearing plants for areas like motion centers and things like that. Uh, thanks a lot.
Right. right. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's rather than the part that's rationalizing everything. Yeah, there was a fun movie about this. Right. 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 Right.